Thanks, Linda. Um, I guess I'm not. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to be the only bureaucrat speaking um, at any kind of forum that involves uh, no other government departments. And I've come to realise that uh, I really do need to put a bit of a disclaimer in here about my role in government. I represent New South Wales Health and particularly environmental health. Now, I'm an environmentalist as much as everyone else in this room, but my role in this issue is the effect of environmental degradation or other um, environmental changes on human health, not on the environment itself. So um, while most environmental degradation issues or in disturbances in the environment, um, that cause major problems environmentally, often also cause human health issues. But not always. So our role in New South Wales Health is to advise on human health risks, adequacy of, adequacy of applications for people wanting to do developments such as coal terminal, new coal seam gas developments, coal mines, etc. Um, and then comment on whether they've actually covered the territory uh, looking at what the potential risk to human health is. Our other roles are in risk communication and that goes two ways. One is to communicate what the real risks are and what the potential for human health risks are uh, for any kind of development, but also to reassure people if we find that there actually is none or insignificant risk to human health. So we actually should do both. I want to just cover a couple of um, slides looking at the, um, the major potential human health risks from certain types of development. This is where windmills will come in, as you'll find out in a minute. The first is on coal. In coal, we have some uh, unequivocal evidence that particulate matter can kill people. There is a, it's the major cause of preventable death in the Western world, bar none. So most people don't realise that uh, that is the greatest cause, um, preventable cause, that we can actually save billions of dollars of, uh, and hundreds of thousands of uh, lives just by reducing particulate matter in our um, urban and rural environments. The issue with that is coal mines do um, cause dust. We get dust, particulate matter from a range of sources, cutting into open cut coal mines. You get overburdened dust blowing off. You get coal dust blowing off the back of trains. You get diesel emissions from off-road diesel. You get diesel emissions from ships coming in to take uh, coal away. You get diesel emissions from trains transporting um, the substances. Plus you get other uh, types of emissions as well. So there's a range of particulate matter uh, issues with coal mines. And that's well known and well established and that's the first thing we ever look at in a health risk assessment. Have they actually characterised how much dust is going to come off this? How does it uh, add to the dust that's already there? Um, and what does this mean to the human health of people surrounding those developments? Noise and vibration. Noise actually is a risk to human health. It's not just an amenity issue. Um, there is reasonable evidence out there to suggest that um, exposure to noise, particularly nighttime noise, can lead to a real hum pathophysiological human health risks. Um, so there is an issue there that we look at um, as a second thing. The next thing, of course, is surface and groundwater contamination. And um, from a human health perspective, we're mainly interested in uh, water that would be used by people for drinking purposes and whether this is likely to be contaminated uh, with VTEX and other substances that are likely to uh, emanate from coal mines. And the last thing is social impacts. Now social impacts is the most difficult thing to consider because that has a range of issues in it that uh, have both pathophysiological um, antecedents, epidemiological and toxicologically proven pathways and also other um, issues that are very much more difficult to put our fingers on. And I'll concentrate on that in a moment. Coal seam gas has similar sorts of um, issues that coal mining has. We've got surface and groundwater contamination. That's the main potential risk that we in health are concerned about. You're probably well aware of the um, proposed Camden expansion of the coal seam gas mining. And you're probably well aware that that was in the newspapers and there was lots of headlines around that, uh, including uh, lines that New South Wales Health said no. We actually didn't say no. All we said was that uh, the health risk assessments that were put before us were inadequate. 
they didn't actually properly examine whether there was any potential risk to human health from these developments. And we said we couldn't uh, agree with any development um, that went ahead without a proper human health risk assessment. That had the effect, essentially, of changing the government's view on exclusion criteria around coal seam gas. It wasn't what we actually asked the government to do, but the effect was that uh, the expansion of those areas has now stopped. Noise and vibration is an issue uh, with um, coal seam gas, particularly uh, the noise associated with uh, drilling and fracking and the noise associated with the constant transport of um, water to and from uh, fracking sites. Particulate matter, that's primarily from transport where you get dust coming from roads around each of the drilling wells, etc. Fugitive emissions is a possible health consequence, but at this stage it's unclear how much fugitive emissions actually do come from coal seam gases. Uh, gas pipeline incidents are a risk. Uh, the probability of that risk is low, but it still needs to be considered. And again, we think about social impacts and um, what they may, how they may occur. Wind farms are a different kettle of fish, but they're in the same sort of um, zone. These are all, the, the linking thing for these three is that they're all about providing power and energy and um, they're th the three major sources um, for our society of actually getting power. Noise and vibration is uh, something that is promulgated by many as uh, being a major issue for windmills. They cite a thing called infrasound. Infrasound is noise that you can't hear, so it's more akin to vibration. Um, and that uh, there are many papers that uh, will suggest that this may be a potential human health risk. None of them published. Uh, the published literature doesn't seem to suggest that at all. Um, particulate matter, again, we have an issue with windmills around uh, dirt roads leading to many, many windmills and potential dust coming from those from traffic tra travelling over that. But that's not really a major issue because there isn't much traffic between windmills most of the time. Blade, glint, blade incidents are um, something that uh, is, again, hypothesised rather than actually being a real human health risk. And then we have social impacts, which is, again, a really important issue for uh, people around wind farm developments. If we want to actually look at uh, a relative ranking of the potential health risks from these developments, you see that uh, I've given this a score out of five of potential health risk. For coal, particulates really rank high up there. There is no low uh, threshold for health risk from particulates. It doesn't matter how low you get, you still have some health risk from breathing in particulate matter. So there's no threshold. We can't say below a certain level, it's all safe. And we, we know that the higher you get, the more risk there is. Noise and vibration, as I said before, there is definite um, uh, health risks from noise and vibration, but um, that's a lesser issue around coal mines. Of course, the closer you get to any coal plant, the more noise you get and the more disturbance you get at night, and there becomes an issue there about whether coal mines should be sited close to large population centres. In fact, whether a coal mine, um, anybody within a certain range of a coal mine should be bought out of their properties uh, before that coal mine could go ahead. And of course that brings its own problems in, in terms of uh, who says someone has to go or whether they can go or whether someone will sell, etc. Then there's uh, water contamination issues. Most people protesting against coal seam gas, for example, forget that in coal mines, I know down here they don't, uh, they can interfere with water um, as much as uh, coal seam gas. So it's a potential major issue for any coal mine development as well as any coal seam gas development. Fugitive emissions again occur from coal mines. What you're doing in a coal seam gas is you're sucking uh, methane out of coal seams. When you go coal mining, you have to get rid of the methane in order to be able to coal mine. You either do that in two ways. You go underground and suck it out through um, extraction fans or you cut in and it just goes straight up when you hit the coal seam. So there are issues of uh, fugitive emissions in coal mining as much as there are in coal seam gas. The last thing is, uh, I. Uh, and you'll see that I've got, against wind farms here, really um, a negative on all of these areas, and that's based on current published 
peer-reviewed literature in terms of the risks um, with the current sighting of wind farms anywhere beyond about 800 <coughs> metres away, and none of these um, issues appear to have any, carry any real health risk. That may be modified after consideration of the NHMRC expert working group's considerations that I sit on, so um, don't quote me to say that this is definitely the case. It is not definitely the case at this point. It just appears to be the case from the published literature. The bottom line is social impacts. And you'll see that I've got um, major concerns across all <coughs> three of these developments. Now, if I had to rank these three developments in terms of potential for risk to human health, coal mining is way up there. Coal seam gas has a question mark over it and windmills have a zero against it. But the community concern around social impacts is equal on all three of these developments. Social impacts have a range of um, possible uh, sources. There's the indirect health impacts from things like social cohesion, uh, physical environment changes, um, access to um, healthcare uh, may change when developments come into town, etc. And there may be things that change in um, a town centre itself, like walkability and uh, access to services. Um, they're the indirect health impacts. There's the major issue of outrage. People get outraged whenever their local environment has been spoiled in their view. Uh, they, that can manifest itself in uh, psychosocial uh, factors that can have uh, an effect on uh, perceived anxiety, depression. Um, solastalgia was mentioned earlier by James, uh, loss of um, distress about uh, loss of uh, environment. For all of these issues, though, there doesn't appear to be any really good documented pathophysiological pathway. So how you actually value this in terms of health outcomes is a uh, problematic issue. Things that exacerbate or mitigate against um, social impacts from outrage. Exacerbating is poor communication or consultation. And we've heard already about um, in a, inadequate consultation with community and with uh, relevant stakeholder groups. Uh, Non-transparency of what's actually going to happen. What's been planned, how it's been planned. Uh, what are the real risks? What are the other factors that are going to be occurring here? The third one is an important issue, and that's inappropriate claims by lobbyists, activists, or self-interest groups. Um, if they're over the top and outrageous, they can actually engender anxiety in a community and cause problems that may not have existed otherwise. There's some quite good evidence on this. Um, so I've uh, put a couple of uh, references in there by Simon Chapman and Felicity Crichton's recent work looking at uh, nocebo effects. And there's ignorance or misrepresentation of hazard without exposure pathways. In other words, people concentrate on the fact that a development is going to lead to exposure to, or rather um, lead to uh, emissions that perhaps may be even carcinogenic, definitely can cause human health problems, such as fracking materials, etc. But they ignore the issue that for a human health to be at risk, you need an exposure pathway. In other words, you might have a hazard, like you've got a poison in the uh, kitchen or the bathroom, but if you don't drink it, you don't get to it, then you actually don't get sick from it. And it's the same thing with any uh, emissions or any other factors that emanate from a development. The bottom line is that you actually have to have an exposure pathway before that becomes an issue. Mitigating. You've got good communication, that's the primary issue. You have to have good communication and you have to have clear presentation of potential risks and of benefits. Most people have seen the risk is hazard plus outrage um, issue that Salman uh, popularised back in the 80s. That hasn't really changed. The hazard is the, um, the thing that will actually cause toxicological problems and health risks and the outrage is the other factors on top of that that, uh, that uh, people are worried about. However, what this equation doesn't really bring out properly <coughs> is that the health risk is a combination of the hazard itself plus the exposure pathway about how that hazard gets to a human and what the exposure levels are by the time they get to a human. I can give an example here of water quality. 
In drinking water, we have NHMRC water quality guidelines that all water utilities must follow. They include uh, limits on a whole range of pollutants in the drinking water, including about 30 carcinogens. However, the NHMRC Water Quality Advisory Committee that I sit on has put limits on those, and they're based on how much excess risk you can have from exposure to each of these particular types of pollutants in the water supply. The issue with that is that you can't get rid of these things. They're there anyway. It's the same with particulate matter. Particulate matter is everywhere. It's a health risk. It can kill you, even at low levels. All you can do is try to put limits on how much of that you're exposed to. This is an interesting quote that I'll let you read. This was by Sandman back in 80, 1987. We're talking, uh, what, 26 years ago. So it's a long time ago now. But this will highlight the fact that uh, people like me have been brought up in a very rational um, way of thinking about the universe, who are professors of epidemiology who have published 200 papers, who understand all there is about methodology and will quite happily see that there is or is not a risk in a particular area and what level of risk that is, may in fact miss the boat in communicating this to the community if we don't engage properly and deal with the outrage elements as well. I would hope I'm not irrational, but just reinforce the fact that uh, for a proper health risk assessment of any kind of development, we need to know what the, the exposure type is, what the hazard is. Is it a particulate matter? Is it, um, is it some kind of poison, etc.? What are the levels of that? What are the pathways for exposure? What's the toxicology or epidemiology? What's the evidence that that exposure level is likely to cause human health risk? And therefore, what's the risk characterization of that? Now, if you use uh, coal seam gas as an example, you put down fracking material, some of which may in fact be quite poisonous. Um, you put it through um, a coal seam and that may absorb um, uh, particular uh, pollutants such as BTEX. That may then go through uh, and pollute uh, groundwater or a surface water or escape to the atmosphere in terms of emissions from methane, etc. The issue that we have with coal seam gas and the qu reason I put question marks around that in the exposure of health risk issues are that if you put down all the fracking material and you get it all back up because of, you have good well integrity and because there are no fault lines and the hydrogeology is such that there's aquitards <coughs> that stop the, um, the coal seams interacting with aquifers, then you've got a closed system and there's no risk to human health of people away from there. However, if the hydrogeology is different from that and you actually have leakage of all of that, then we need to know what the flow rate is, what the uh, concentration levels are likely to be by the time it gets to any sensitive human health receptor um, to find out what the actual uh, risk to them is and then quantify that risk. Um, and the real issue that uh, I want to highlight here is if we look at the fourth dot point down, communicating risk requires acknowledgement of societal risk appetite. In other words, what, how much risk will we as society um, uh, have an appetite for. For drink driving, we'll accept um, 10 to the minus 2 excess risk above and beyond what um, is normally going to happen for um, early death. So in other words, if your rate is uh, 1 in uh, 1,000, we'll accept 1 in 100 beyond that as well. With drinking water, we're talking about 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5. For radiation, we accept 10 to the minus 6. What do we accept for particulate matter? What do we accept for other exposures? That is not a scientific decision. I can do the calculations. I've done the calculations. I've developed incremental guidelines for um, particulate matter. They are scientifically correct, but depend on what is the risk appetite. The risk appetite is something that is uh, drawn from communities' expectation of what excess risk they're willing to take. So it's a community slash political decision, not a scientific decision. Okay, I'll leave it there, thanks.